Welcome, this is Lynn Fraser with the Killaby Center for Recovery, and we are interviewing Scott Killaby today about pain and addiction and recovery from pain and how to live with it and all of the nuances and complexity of that. This is part of the Radical Recovery Summit, and I encourage you to go to killabycenter.com slash radical recovery to learn more about that and sign up to, to know more. So Scott, let's just jump right in. First of all, I would say that you're um, a non-dual teacher, an international speaker. You've got the Killaby Center for Recovery, and you've been doing a lot of personal work as always using the Living Inquiries. And in particular, you've had some challenges around pain this last year and a half. So I, I'm really interested because I know how, how intensely you work with things that are personal. And so what is it that you'd like to start? How do you like to start sharing this with people? Um, it's... You know, until you've, so if, if for those people that are in recovery already, until you get chronic pain, it's hard to understand how important the topic is. Because I think for years, I was in recovery for 15 years before I ever really had to deal with real chronic pain. And I remember listening to people in meetings, you know, when I first got clean of guys that had been there for a decade or so, who, how the, the chronic pain was affecting their quality of life. It had an effect on their their spiritual transformation, um, and they, and you know it was very challenging. But you know, as a young kid or thirty early thirties, just listening to that, it was like okay, what whatever, that's not my problem. But then, okay, what happened was is that I developed a cr chronic injury in my spine. Uh, they don't really know the cause, and then so around two thousand and eighteen, I started to get really I'd always sort of had pain in my spine but I started the pain started to ramp up and ramp up and ramp up and then it was turning into instead of a kind of a musculoskeletal type feeling or sensation it was turning into a nerve pain uh where it was most electric like a live wire um in my spine which was very uncomfortable so it led to um well I mean it certainly led first to processing using our work um, that was the first thing I did. So I have my own personal facilitators, who's, who's my friend, Dan. And during the time when I was starting to experience all the pain, Dan was right there to facilitate me on some of the stories that can come up around pain. Because there's the physical sensation, the in-the-moment sensation that we call pain. But then the mind, of course, like everything, it, the mind will add on these stories here and these beliefs um, as a way, well, whatever it's trying to do, it's trying to either understand it, justify it, um, analyze it, uh, make meaning out of it. Um, and so the stories were the things that I started to look at first. Um, and, and going back, of course, checking in to see if this was related to any of my earlier traumas that I have already been processing. Going back to the bullying, there was some stuff there around bullying and hiding and and we cleared a lot of, you know, we cleared as much as we could that we thought was connected to that. But at some point, you know, I realized that even though there really isn't, a, there is no sort of clear line between what we call the physical and the non-physical, you know, it's like these are just concepts. There was a feeling as though that something physical had to be dealt with, like that I, that I just couldn't work with the emotional and the psychological part of it, the, the physical. So I started to become more open. Because I'd had cancer earlier in my life, I'd become somewhat um, suspicious of Western medicine. So, so it took me a while with the spine pain to eventually go back to Western medicine for to try to find some answers. Uh, because the inquiries were helping me to get clear psychologically and emotionally but the injury itself was just getting worse and worse and worse. So I had surgery. So it got worse and worse um, after the surgery. And so by the, so I had the surgery in October of 2018. By January of 2019, had the most excruciating pain. I was actually in the ER um, with what I would say is a you know 11, level 11 nerve in. It's like it's like a live wire. It feels like a live wire, a fiery wire in your spine. 
And so I was at, at the suicidal, I'll just be honest with you, I was having suicidal ideation. And I had some insights about suicidal ideation. Um, it's not what I always thought it was during those periods of time. Um, the, what I think it does, the mind produces that as a way to have an option to give some sort of peace of mind in a difficult process. And my mind was just giving the option that, oh, yeah, well, you could take your own life in, because I was not finding any other options. Like the Eastern side of things could answer something to some degree, but could not fully answer it. And the Western medicine could could help to some degree, but could but nobody could come together and really provide me real options. And so when the mind starts running out of options, it just produces another option, which is, oh, just go kill yourself, you know? Of course, because we have inquiry, and I wasn't depressed. It wasn't like my life is awful, I'm a bad person, and I want to die. It was, this is physically, physically very, very, very impossible to live with in this moment. Like there's no, I, in, other than just literally putting morphine throughout my whole body, there's nothing that you could do other than I can kill myself. That's the only other option to deal with this level of intensity of pain. So, but with the- So it's almost like a practical. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't, it was because of the work, I don't have a lot of fear of death because of the work that we do. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, oh, it's a scary thing for me to, to take my own life. It was more like a practical sort of like option um, mm -hmm. that came up a few times in the worst moments. Now, in those worst moments has been our inquiries and our work unraveled that thought and a lot of other thoughts and stories that were connected to it so I could get back to just being with the sensation of pain and then taking steps to try to heal it or, or manage it. Or, so it's, it's, it's been about intervening on myself when I need to um, and the psychological and emotional part of it to calm that down so that I can deal with the physical from a state of presence. So I can deal with the physical sensation, not from an ego state where I'm telling a lot of stories and justifications and not, not dealing with the pain from that place, that really emotional place, but dealing with it from more from awareness. So I could just be with it in the moment without the layers of stories. So that's what's happened for me. I mean, the layers of stories have fallen away through inquiry. And what I get now is uh, just a persistent sort of in the moment, very uncomfortable sensation that wanes, it, it changes day by day. And I sort of just deal with it according to what comes up. So let's go into that a little bit more. So you said um, going into awareness and being present with it and how on a practical kind of a detailed level, how, how might someone do that if they have pain? Especially so, that level of pain. That's uh, really compelling. I think, I, I do think when you get to a certain level of pain, you know, sometimes you do need a medication just to bring the thing down a bit. Like you, to take the edges off of it and to, to the intensity down a little bit, just so you can actually physically set and process something. Like if, if pain is bad enough, especially nerve pain, it's really, really hard to sit in one place. Okay. for very long so you have to, so, so the medication would often take the um what at times when it got bad i'd have to take medication to take the edge off and then i would start to do the inquiry on and so now i've forgotten your question um but repeat your question so if someone has pain so you you talked about staying present with it you talked about being in awareness so what are the kind of the steps they might take okay Right. So once you take the edge off, if, if, you, if one needs medication, it doesn't have to be a controlled substance. It could be any medication that works to take the edge off where you can actually sit in your own body where enough to really process this. What I learned, I've learned so much about pain, like from an experiential point, point of view, um, understanding what it is that's not understanding it, but seeing from awareness what's actually going on when you're in pain. And the, as best I can tell, there's like the original injury in the spine or the, the I don't know what you call it, the central focus of the pain, the central focal point. But then around that is this very unconscious, subtle, sometimes not so subtle 
resistance and trying to fix it and manage it and constant. So the big thing I noticed was a constant sort of monitoring and fixating on that area. So one of the first things that I did is to start to just work with the fixation and the resistance because I couldn't heal the injury itself. I mean, it was literally a bone in my spine protruding into my spinal cord. So it's not like I had an inquiry that could undo the physical part of that. Um, but I could look at um, some of the other things around it. And um, I can go through some of those things. Um, but what I learned about the resistance, um, before we go into the stories that you could look at, what I noticed is like, here's how I help people now with, with pain is what, I have them get really quiet. And instead of like really focusing or, or feeling the sensation of pain directly from presence, I have them instead start looking for the movements that are outside of that, that are trying to do something with the pain. So for me, the, what the, the doing something was an unconscious fixating. So it's like the, the con my consciousness was like just drawn to that area constantly, like a chronic addiction, like an addiction to that area and monitoring whether it's okay in this moment or is it manageable or is it, you know, and it's, it's almost like the nervous system is worried. And so it can't just sit back and rest. It has to constantly monitor what's going on in that area. But the mm -hmm. constant monitoring is what creates a fixation and keeps the chronic element of the pain alive because the fixation is creating a resistance there's like a resistance in there and so as you're monitoring constantly you're you're resisting the thing and then that's keeping it around so what i the first things i started to work with is how do you relax or reduce this monitoring this mm -hmm. constant fixating and so i developed one technique which i can't tell you because we're still we're still working with it. It's very powerful, actually, for that kind of pain that anyone has that's stationary. And, and what it does is it just, it just takes away the fixation, this new method that we have. And I don't even think I've even told you about it. We're keeping it really secret until we're here developing it at the Kildare Center. But what happened one day, just to let you know, because you're really asking me how I've dealt, the story of how I've dealt with this pain. This is a really important part of the story. I was sitting in my RV, you know, I live in an RV with my partner and by choice, <laughs> people are always saying, oh, I'm so sorry you live in an RV. We're like, no, we actually want to live in an RV. Um, but it was at those, one of those points in time, Lynn, when I felt truly um, like I had no options. I had just received a call or a text from my doctor who said, your insurance company has again denied or the authorization of this medical procedure. Because what I've been trying to do is to get surgeries and medical procedures that will help me so that I don't have to take medicines, you know? Mm -hmm. so I can, but insurance denied has denied literally almost every one of those, which is a whole nother topic um, that I know you don't deal with in Canada as much as we do here. But so coming back to, um, just that day when I felt like I had no options and I just heard from the doctor. Um, it was in those moments, in those moments of necessity, they say, you know, that's when invention mm -hmm. comes up. What is the necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. Yeah. Sitting in my RV, you know, it's like before I had options, you know, the doctor said, well, we were going to work on authorizing this procedure and then we're going to work on this. And then all these options go away. And there, then there's no options. So I'm at that place again, where when there's no options, the suicidal ideation, if you're not careful, can come up. It didn't come up that day. And instead what came up strangely, this is the oddest thing, is a, a picture that I had taken a couple of months ago of a, of a new tattoo that I had on my back. And there's a tattoo right across my shoulders now that says, Halte den Geist frei. And it's a German for keep your mind clear. Oh. Yeah. I got the tattoo out of like an intuition that there was something in that statement that was important to me in my life right now. So I literally felt so, so drawn to that phrase that I tattooed it here. And I don't, I didn't know why I tattooed it there, but then two months later I'm sitting in my RV having no options. And just lo and behold, the, this picture comes up of me with, I just got my tattoo and there it is. 
And I start looking at the picture and I can tell in the picture, I could like the mind was locating where the pain is in the picture. It was assimilating and it was like saying, oh yeah, in that area of the spine is, is exactly, and this is how you feel it. And I started to see what the mind does. It's like, it's looking for location. Um, it's It wants to know exactly where the pain is. And it'll even do that with a photograph. Like it will literally do that. So if you see a photograph of yourself, the mind will locate exactly where the pain is. And I found that to be fascinating. And so what I did is I started experimenting with this, how the mind tries to locate pain and came up with this technique that actually makes it impossible for the mind to locate the pain. Oh, interesting. Yeah, using a photograph of the area. So the people are looking at a photograph of the area and then turning that into a mental image. And then once they turn it into a mental image, we are helping them disconnect from the fixation with that image, which is really the fixation with that area of the body. Mm -hmm. So when you diminish or reduce or eliminate the fixation with that area of the body as it appears in the mind, you get relief in the body because that's how the, because the mind doesn't know what to do. It's like, I don't know how to locate this anymore. So there's just presence here without location. And so therefore I don't have any pain or my pain is at zero one. So it's, it, I just noticed, first of all, it was bringing my pain from six to seven to zero one. Um, and then I started to do it with other people with pa pancreatitis, arthritis, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, long-term knee injuries where people were going to surgery for hip injuries. And it was working on almost everybody that had a pain that was stationary, that would just literally, for some reason, because of the location of the mind. So if anybody that I was working with had a pain that was in a fixed location, the method works really well on, like unbelievably well on. Um, but if the pain migrates or changes a lot, it, it's, it's more difficult to work with have a pain that migrates. So my pain is not stationary. So the method that I developed for stationary pain doesn't work quite well with the, it's working great for a lot of clients I have with stationary pain, but with pain that literally migrates up and down the spine and into the head, I couldn't get the location of it uh, and work with it. So then I had to work with it on just an awareness level. So here's, and these are all things that, can help people. I mean, if, if anybody out there is listening and you have fixed pain in a certain location, just come to me and talk to me about that because we've, we have the, I'll just quite frankly, we've developed a method for fixed pain location that works really well to reduce pain. So, but um, in terms of, but how do you, how else was I working with pain was I was working with the fixation and what I started to see is like, Fixating is, is something that's happening almost outside of the sensation, or it's not necessarily part of the sensation. It's like how the body or the system is responding to the sensation by constantly monitoring it. So what I notice is that, you know, once you have people turn awareness towards the monitoring movement and not focusing so much on the sensation, but just being aware and present to how the consciousness wants to narrow its focus to monitor that area. So just watching the monitoring, literally watching it from awareness, from a quiet mind, just watching it will actually diminishes its power. So over a time, as you're watching the fixation, I mean, it starts like it wants to do this, like it wants to fix it. There's something wrong here and I got to focus on it. But as you watch it, that movement starts to slow down over time. Because it's like being it's like being brought into the light of awareness, that movement. And then as it really starts to slow down, you start to get pain relief because the fixating is part of the reason that there's a chronic pain there. It's a chronic fixation. So as the fixation, the chronic fixation starts to relax, so does the pain. So that's one thing I'm working with people, regardless of whether they have pain in one place that's fixed or moving, it works either way if there's a fixating or a and the same is true with when i say fixating i also mean just resistance and that's a word that i think people may be more familiar with and and and, and it works the same way so if i have a physical pain in my chest 
um, if I'm not comfortable calling it fixation, um, is there resistance to it? You know, it's like, is there some, is the system fighting against it? Um, it although that sounds rational, my system is fighting against it because it wants to get, what happens is that, that resistance starts to amp up. Actually, the pain can get worse. It doesn't get better. The insight that there's something there and that I have to fix it can lead to more pain. <laughs> and if you don't actually start to see what is going on. Um, and one of the things that's going on is we are, when we're against something, it's harder for that thing to heal. Like when we, t right? We take a psychological stance or an emotional stance against something. It's just, it's again, it's two opposing forces trying, you know, trying to work something out. What I noticed is when I would actually, again, just with resistance, um, when I would just allow the resistance fully, I would notice however it comes up and just literally watch it and allow it. It too would diminish over time. Mm -hmm. And then as it would diminish, I would get pain relief. So these are the ways that I've been able to function is to get without having to take a whole lot of controlled substances, which I'll talk about in a second, because I mm -hmm. had to take two for a while. Mm -hmm. but these are the ways that I've been engaging in harm reduction to bring the body into a state where I can actually be in it, so to speak, <laughs> where I can actually physically be in my skin and sit in one place. These are the mm -hmm. things that have helped. It makes sense when we think about how the nervous system works too, because the nervous system is always trying to heal the body. So it's always on alert for something that's wrong. It's yeah. part of the kind of the primitive brain. It doesn't have a lot of nuance. <laughs> And so it's just like, oh my God, there's something there. I need to do something. And then yeah. we act around that. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm not a brain scientist, or, but, but yeah, I think those out there who understand the mechanics of the brain will be able to translate that in their, into their language of what's going on. And I love the way you say that because it's just like the primitive brain just reacts. It's just like, yeah, it doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't really have a solution. <laughs> it doesn't have any solutions. Yeah. It's just that there's something terribly wrong. Right. Um, which is good for us to know that there's something terribly wrong. It's just that, what do we do then? What do we do then? Yeah. And then the mammalian brain or the part of the brain that produces the emotions and the psychological traumatic sort of themes in our life, that can start to come up then around that physical sensation and build stories, content, beliefs that actually can make the pain, sometimes can make the pain better for sure, mm -hmm. but can also make the pain worse. Because it, it, because it adds to the preoccupation with the pain. So it's not just now that you have a constant chronic pain, you have a constant story that the pain means this. Or, or we don't know if it's gonna get worse too. Right, and we think it, and, we, and the story is yeah. that it's going to get worse yeah. or I'm not, or what if that's, yeah. yeah. This last weekend we had a hurricane in Nova Scotia and I noticed that was something that was going on in my mind too. It was like the, the winds were building up and then we got into the eye of the hurricane, but we didn't know how much worse it was going to get. And as it turned out, it didn't, it wasn't stronger on the, on the back end. It was stronger on the front end, but yeah. you don't know. And that's part of the, the fear is we don't know what's going to happen and we, we want to prepare for the worst. And, you know, how do we do that? And still, I mean, we really need to have a lot of awareness and clarity in our mind to stay present and, yeah. and not follow that catastrophic thinking yeah and you know i yeah. gotta share something too um there's a flip side of this there's a nuanced flip side of this that I, that I know you'll get lynn which is that as the stories in the mind the mental chatter around pain or injury as that starts to quiet what happens is there's there's just more presence mm. um, there's more awareness more present awareness so it's because the consciousness is being untangled and untangled from its stories Mm -hmm. and it's constant and so then what you get left with is the presence with the physical sensation that's there mm -hmm. um by itself i don't know where i was going with that other than to say i feel like if if you're going to work with pain the way that we do it you would probably start with the stories and the psychological emotional stuff that's been built around the sensation mm -hmm. somebody right just work with that first you know what deficiency stories are connected to the injury? You know, is it like I'm broken or I'll never get better? 
I mean, working with those psychological stories and then getting down to just the bare sensation of pain. I think that's the important part. But, but the point that I was trying to make is this is where it gets tricky. And what I've noticed is that even though we value in, in, our, in our communities, our awakening communities, we value awareness because we know that awareness can bring us more in tune with our bodies and our experience. What happens is that it's harder to distract from pain as you wake up. Mm -hmm. See, it's just, you can do it, but you're aware that you're doing it. And because your mind is not as busy as it was, your mind doesn't help you very much in distracting. It goes quiet. Now, after a while so when it keeps going quiet what happens is that you're then sort of forced to kind of you, you can't distract mm -hmm. you just can't distract mm -hmm. easily you know i remember being in pain earlier in my life but all i a lot of what i did and there's studies that show that it, it's actually effective is just to distract myself mm -hmm. through thinking or doing right and i just noticed that i can't do that as well now so it's, it's more, which is good. I have to then deal with the issue. I can't just keep bypassing it. But the flip side of that is that kind of sucks because then I can't bypass it. <laughs> For a certain day, I would love to bypass it and just go around it. Right. So can, you, can you talk a little bit about what are some of the common beliefs that people have around their pain? Yeah, that they're broken. Um, that they, yeah, that's a big one, broken. Um, it's some, but it goes to, I'm not good enough. I'm unlovable. There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. It's very common. Um, I know you could probably think of a few that I'm not thinking of right now. I'm a victim, and, you know, um, mm -hmm. like life has dealt me this impossible hand and I'm the, I'm the victim of that. These are all deficiency stories that I see. I'll never get better. It's kind of a story of just, I think a lot of people have to deal with. But there's also a lot of de non-deficiency stories that hang around injury and illness. You know, like one of the things I had to work with is what, you know, it's like Dan McClintock, one of our facilitators here came up with the utility inquiry. And he, and one day when he was facilitating me, the utility inquiry tries to get at the, uh, the purpose or the utility behind suffering. It's like the, the assumption is, is that we're not just suffering in a vacuum. Like there's a reason, like mm -hmm. we, it's sometimes even a strategy behind the thing that creates our suffering. Mm -hmm. so, so for example, someone, well, I don't know what a good example is, but Dan came up to me and he said, you want to inquire into something? I said, sure. And he said, say this, Scott, say, I don't get anything out of, having this pain and immediately i was like oh, okay i don't want to do this inquiry <laughs> yeah because i can tell there is something that i'm getting out of it and now you're trying to mess with it and i don't want to see it because i don't want to know that it's there right to be honest and what was coming up was well this is how i can get out this is how it's this is how i can gain control of my life i don't have to work i don't have to work as many hours if i'm I don't have to do this. I have an excuse to get out of that. And I, you know, I learned that early on in life too, that when you're sick, you don't have to go to school. You can get out of this or that. So I really had to look at how that, that how unconsciously my system was using the pain to get benefit. Because once it's getting benefit out of it, that there's less motivation to continue inquiring and working on healing it because it's actually giving you something in your life. It's mm -hmm. giving you, Oh, I get the freedom of not having to do the nine to five because physically I can't. So that gives me something and it takes away some of the motivation to look at trying to heal the thing. So he was really good. And we started to turn the, our pain work into looking at the utility behind the pain. What do you get out of having cancer? Now, of course, that's a shocking question to ask someone. What do you get out of cancer? It's almost defensive. Mm -hmm. But if you, but if you sit with it, we do get things out of being sick. When we get love, we get attention, we get um, acknowledgement, just that we're here. Mm -hmm. um, we get identity. We find out who we are through these things, or we think we know who we are, like I'm a cancer survivor. We get identity. We get a lot of other things. 
And if we're going to get something out of our suffering, there's just going to be less motivation to deal with the suffering. So you almost have to deal with the utility part of it to, to see that, the, no, 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 this is all illusion. Like I, that I don't need to do this. I don't need to use the pain in order to try to control my work life. I mean, there's a feeling like, okay, that's falling away or whatever other stories are falling away again so that we can work with the bare sensation not the stories right. that have been built around it but coming trying to get back to the bare sensation always coming back to the body trust the body right so years ago i had um a lot of fibroids and i had to have uh, my uterus removed and i was a couple of years into meditating and there was kind of a feeling nobody said it directly but i kind of felt like a bit of a a spiritual failure because I couldn't cure it on my own that I needed surgery for it and I recently come across someone who's kind of the same she said well you know I believe in the power of manifesting and and I I should be able to heal my body I shouldn't need surgery is that something that you've come across too I'm so glad you answered you asked the question um yes have I come across it um yes and and I don't have the answer to this one but there's a lot of people who say, and I know where it's coming from, where they say that all physical injury comes from, at its root, some trauma or emotional or psychological thing. And I don't think that, I can't say that that's not true, but, but my mind as also includes the scientific model in it. It's like it doesn't treat it as God or treat it as, it, but it, you're going to have to give me more than just some speculation that everything that's physical injury or illness is caused you have to give me more than just a belief that that's true you have to show me something whether that scientific uh, model has been brought to that through tests or studies or something or experientially and anecdotally we can see these changes in people that like literally when they resolve a trauma around x the injury that's connected to x goes away and you have to have that anecdotal evidence. You can't just go around spouting things off that you can't, you, that you have no experience of. So if you have an experience of a healing or experience of that, okay. But if you have a conjecture about it, I'm going to reject your conjecture. I'm going to challenge your conjecture because you got to give me something more than you think that this is true. It's got, it's got, I've got to test this out, whether it really is true. Right. Yeah. Well, and there's another nuance here too. Like, I don't know if you remember several years ago, I was at the Killaby Center as a client and I had this persistent pain in between my shoulder blades. I had had it for 30 years and it disappeared during a session and it's never come back. Not it was clearly trauma related. And when I got to that certain point in healing the trauma, it never came back. So that's true. Yeah. And and that doesn't mean that I should be able to kind of think my way into healing my body yeah. or that I should feel shame because I she haven't been, yeah. right? So I, I think there's, there's, it's, it's more nuanced than that. It's, it's really important not to shame ourselves for not being able to heal our body. It is. There, there's it's lots of nuances. There's so many nuances because you're, you're the story and I've, and I've worked with people who literally I mean, I just had one recently who tested with a severe mental illness. And then as, after working with the person, they didn't test as having that mental illness anymore. It literally healed it. Like they, the, the standardized test for that mental illness showed you don't have that mental illness. And this was a serious mental illness. Like they, this was like a, you know, how they have different tiers. This was way up. Yeah. There. I, won't, I won't tell you what the illness is because I want to protect the privacy of the patient. Um, but yeah, she, she literally got a healing um, from it, like, literally. Um, and so there's those stories too. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, okay, that's, that's fine. I, think that I, don't, I don't think we know yet that every injury or illness, it has simply a, tra a trauma or an emotional psychological component that once we deal with the thing, I don't think we have that evidence yet. We have evidence, anecdotal evidence of things that like it was happened to you where we have those stories, but we don't have any way of knowing for sure that that's the way that every single injury and illness is that can be dealt with. We don't have that yet. 
I mean, I'm open, obviously, to examine that, but I don't want to buy into it without having some experiential validation for it. I want to see it working before I actually, and I, I of course, want to stay completely open to the idea um, mm -hmm. that it, it all may sense. be. It makes sense intuitively that contracting around something is going to make it worse. Yeah. So that whether you know whether it's the cause of it or not the cause of it if we can release the contraction we can release the ideas the thoughts that will help you know and i think that's what i think you're right and i think that's what we're trying to do here at the kill center and us because you're part of the, our whole bigger family is that we're trying to figure out we're trying to figure these things out for people mm -hmm. we're trying to to really really explore these areas to see if that's if there really is a psychological and emotional and I think it's more like that I don't want to postulate that there is. I want to go discover and see. There's too many people out there making theories about this instead of just saying, is it actually true in our experience that when we resolve it, the, the, you know, I want to see that kind of thing happen. And rather than just the random story of success that I hear like with, with you, Lynn, mm -hmm. or a few that I've worked with, um, I just want to see that happening more before you're going to see, see me open my mouth and say something like that every injury or illness is simply an emotional or psychological hang up. I'm just not there yet. I'm not there yet because of my own personal experience here. Right. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating how, how this all works and whether it's emotional pain, psychological pain, physical pain, we always resist it and the mind always makes stories about it. And then we have I always try to fix it. It's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. that's, that's being human right there is what I heard. So do you want to talk a little bit about um, how people might want to work with sensation, you know, putting space around it, that kind of thing? Yeah. I'm sure everybody would be familiar with that. Um, yeah, we can do a little bit of experiential work for those of you out there listening who have some physical sensation or injury that you want to work with. Um, I mean, I'm not going to take people through like formal inquiry because th that's too content specific. It's like, I don't know what Mary in um, Ireland right now, what stories she's got versus wh what Joe has in Montana that's listening right now. So I can't do a lot of content specific, which is the, where the real meat of this is, but we can do some very general like group inquiry or exploration to work with something that's common to all of us. I mean, because the content is different for each of us. It's like, I, I might believe this about my painter, but you might believe that. But one thing I think we all have in common is that when there's something weird going on in our system, the nervous system starts to try to, it gets worried. We have that resistance in common uh, and that so or clinging resistance, fixation in common. So to do a little exercise again on that, um, everybody's ready for that yeah mm -hmm. so start by getting comfortable and you know even if when you're in pain that's always a kind of an ironic thing to say it's like well there you know some people are like there's no such thing as comfortable um but just get in the position where you're not where you're not the position itself is not making the pain worse <laughs> And then start to, you know, however you access as a meditator, however you access present moment awareness, just start with that. So whether it's through breathing or just looking around and noticing colors and shapes without, and sounds without stories and meanings, just kind of being in the now, start there. You know, you can also, as you're, playing with that you can notice the space as you close your eyes you can kind of notice the space Every, really everywhere around us to the right to the left um, above us below us in front of us you can sense the the space of life everywhere and you can also start to experience it within as you feel into the body you notice some sensations which are denser than space but as you start to explore those sensations they they start to feel more and more like spaciousness so kind of just bringing your attention down into the sensations right now and 
um, feeling into them with your attention. Okay, so here's a really, really cool thing Lynn, that I've been helping people with. And this next thing has helped me tremendously with the um, resistance part of pain. So I have to explain it and then you have to kind of apply it to your, your actual experience like to work with a particular sensation that you're having. The, the idea is, is that like normally, like you say, we're always trying to fix ourselves. We're trying to feel better. We're trying to resist what we're feeling. So these things that I've been developing are about undoing that desire to fix and change and heal. Um, and instead more rest with and allow the body to work itself out within the presence, like to work itself the wisdom of just being present to something and letting something just kind of, because there's a parasympathetic element to that. Like you're putting yourself almost into a parasympathetic state when you're reducing all resistance to what is. Whatever you're feeling, when the resistance goes down, there's a parasympathetic, parasympathetic element to that. And, and we know now, I think we know that parasympathetic state is where healing tends to happen more. So how do we get there? You can't be in that parasympathetic state when you've got a lot of internal fixating on the thing because there's a lot of activity there. There's no rest. So it's just a matter of getting quiet and noting where the sensation or the injury is, but then turning your awareness more towards what are the movements that are trying to narrow the focus of my consciousness constantly down to this one area. It's a movement of narrowing consciousness the focus of it in open focus they talk about you, how you can have an open focus of the present moment which what we call presence where you're just aware of not any particular detail you're just aware of the entirety of life appearing okay that's an open focus but what we do with pain and almost every problem whatever it is is we do narrow focus so we start to focus, so let's say I have a pain in my shoulder, I'm, I'm narrowing my consciousness. I'm actually ignoring a lot of other things that I could be looking at, and I'm narrowing it down to this one area and then constantly fixating on how that area is doing. So if you're listening to me and you feel that, if that resonates with you, that that's going on, all I'm asking you to do is turn your attention not to the sensation, but to the movement within you that's, that wants to monitor, fixate, change, get rid of, and just and watch and allow that. That's one way to do it. It's just to rest in the sensation and watch and allow. And the more you watch and allow anything in awareness, the more you take its power away because it can only sort of do what it does when there's no awareness on it. It thrives in the dark, you know? So as you're just sitting there watching, just watching resistance, it loses its momentum over time. And as it loses its momentum and the, re and the resistance relaxes, the pain can then get down to a more manageable level with it. Um, so that's one thing is just noticing resistance. If the word resistance doesn't resonate with someone, the word fixation might. Fixation to me has to do with the, also with the frequency at which we are focusing on. Well, it's not just that we've narrowed our focus to this, but there's a frequent sort of monitoring of that. And so it's a fixating, you know, yeah, it's like compulsive. A compulsive, almost addictive, mm -hmm. chronic fixating on the location. So again, instead of resting with the sensation, what I tell people is to, um, as I said, you can watch for all that resistance and stuff. That's, we call that the now method, resting and feeling, and then noticing the space around something, and then just watching and allowing any sort of movement that's trying to fix it or change it so, so that the parasympathetic element can come in. But what I've been talking about recently, which I'm excited about, is what I call the dance. And so the dance is something different. It's, um, let's say you have a, a pain well, let me just give you from my own, how I work with it, with my spine pain. Um, again, I don't want to come back to medications and addictions. Mm -hmm. because It's a relevant conversation. 
because sometimes I would have to take um, either a controlled substance or a non-controlled substance to take the edge off to get from 10 to eight, just to be in my body in order to frankly do the inquiry because literally physically there have been moments when I, you know, you can't. So if you're, if, so if you're at that level 10 and someone's telling you to rest, it's really, really difficult to do that. I mean, you can rest and you can quiet things down, but the pain, if the source of the pain is still there, it hurts and there's, and it's still going on the resistance. So, um, I tell people just to watch for the fixation so or watch for the resistance, but, but to do it in a different way. So the dance is like this. The dance is when you feel a sensation or an emotion, you bring your attention into the sensation or emotion very restfully, like without any force and without any desire to change it, you just bring your attention right in there and just sort of rest for a moment. Now you have your attention inside the thing. So now if you think about a, a dance that happens on a dance floor, one person always has to kind of lead the dance. Like if both people try to lead the dance, it becomes this clumsy thing and it doesn't work, right? Because there's, they're resisting each other, right? But when there's a dance that works, the one person gently leads the dance and the other person follows along almost in real time, tracking movements. And it's a beautiful kind of metaphor for non-resistance and surrender. And so if you take that into your experiential work, having my attention inside the spine sensation and then letting the spine sensation lead the dance. So, which means all I, ha I have my attention inside of it, but the attention is not trying to guide the dance. Letting the sensation is, is allowed to move and change or even stay stuck on its own. And the attention is just, following it almost supporting each movement so literally even if it wants to contract it's like the attention can contract lovingly with it so it's not against the movement so whenever we're not against the movement of something inside of us we're starting that healing process whenever we start to be against something we're at this these two things that are opposing each other the war inside creates more distress more anxiety yeah. which is could make the injury or illness worse. So instead, the dance is about just feeling into it and letting the sensation move and change or feel stuck and letting the attention just move like it's dancing with that. And that's been really powerful to help people get out of this constant desire to try to fix and feel better and monitor and interfere with and neutralize and get rid of, which often just makes it worse because it's adding all fixation. It's just mm -hmm. more fixation with it. So mm. um, these methods are designed to relax the fixation, not to increase it. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about addiction and, yes. uh, and opioids and all of the ways that people manage pain. Yeah. There's a joke. Here's a joke like around my pain and, and some of the facilitators around me make the joke is that like Scott in his early re, uh, addiction 15, 20 years ago, what I would have done is I would have manufactured any story that I could in order to get more painkillers. Yeah. Okay. That was the whole operation. It's like, yeah. how could I manufacture something in order to get even including even how can I actually make the pain worse? so that I can feel justified in getting my painkillers. So after 15 years later of doing this inquiry and mindfulness work, it's the exact opposite now. I have to do inquiry on even being able to take a, a non-controlled medication. And I certainly have to do inquiry on taking a controlled substance. And it's not because I have this sort of old model view that these things are just bad things. It's that my body somatically rejects these things and that's what happens with this work somatically the body starts to to run the show and so if it doesn't like something you're not going to take it again or eat it again because the body has the final say if it doesn't want it you're not going to be able to indulge in it including compulsively because the body's saying no that's a very powerful thing because it can say no to a substance that's been addictive right mm -hmm. but 
but that's not been my problem. My problem was not that, um, that, that I was becoming addicted. The problem was is that I needed painkillers after the surgery just to get through the pain. But I literally had to do inquiry on taking them because my body rejects painkillers because of the work. But it literally rejects it. Like it, it just says no, no, every time. And I had to do inquiries, first of all, just to be able to take a painkiller or two. Okay. Same mm -hmm. thing. That, so but here's, the, here's the amazing journey that's happened for me when you talk about recovery in the last year. Everything feels different about recovery having gone through this pain because now I know that pain is like a lot of other drivers. So the somatic no that comes up with what we call the new model of recovery, because the new model doesn't focus on like bearing down on people. Stop drinking. Stop. Put a plug in the jug. It doesn't focus on that. What it focuses is on is the understanding that people are using addictive substance and medication as a way to survive something they don't know how to survive otherwise like they're literally drinking to survive because they haven't dealt they haven't found a better way um, and so we should stop demonizing them and start understanding them and so I got understanding from my own here understanding that pain Physical pain is a driver, can be a driver towards addiction, just like emotional pain can be. So I, first of all, needed to deal with the emotional and psychological components connected to the pain. Otherwise, my old addict brain was going to want to go back to the pills as a way to quiet the emotional and psychological stuff, just to numb out. So I had to deal with that. But then, so once I dealt with that, then I'm just dealing with the sensation of pain in the, in the moment. And that's where you have to be really aware of the constant monitoring because the monitoring is where you think that the monitoring is making it better or that it's necessary. But I think there's something to do with the chronic monitoring of the area, which is actually making the pain chronic because you're constantly going back to location and how am I doing in that area? And that fixation is what keeps the chronic element of that. It makes it chronic because you're constantly doing it. Mm -hmm. One, sense. Yeah. So we're just trying to undo fixation. So if I were going to do going back to the group exercise for those who want to kind of come back to that is close your eyes and look for um, starting with the first way. The now method is just kind of feel into the sensation wherever it is, noticing space around it, and then just watching and allowing for any movement that would try to change it, make it better, and just allow that to just come and go until that all peters out, until like there's nothing around it that seems to want to do anything with it. And once you get to that stage, you're gonna already have pain reduction because once you have resistance reduction, you have pain reduction. So that's just one thing is just watching, becoming aware of the ways in which I'm unconsciously resisting this and then not analyzing any of that, just observing it from awareness, letting it be seen and then letting it fall away constantly so that the entire movement of resisting or uh, fixating starts to slow down or quiet. And then the other thing I'll do, again, which has been tremendously helpful, and I do this more than others, I do the dance. So, because I'm aware of like when two two forces are working against each other, there's there's not much movement, there's not much transformation because each has its own agenda and they're fighting each other. So I was trying to think of like, well, how does one become in alignment with like complete acceptance with a sensation? Because if you take any stance against it, you've got the war going on, and you know and how successful are war? I mean, the war on drugs, the war on you know, it's like the war on pain, how successful it's going to be. Is war the answer to our healing, you know? So it's like trying to teach people to be more loving and to be more tuned in to how they are using their desire to heal and get better as a way to actually keep the pain around. They don't know it, but it's keeping it around because it's, there's a preoccupation and a fixation of healing that keeps the mind racing around the story of I have pain, I'm always going to have pain. 
which that kind of thinking exacerbates the emotional component that makes it worse emotionally, you get stressed out, you get anxious, and then that affects the physical because we now know that when you're stressed about something, it sends signal or sends chemicals into the body, stress chemicals, which you see it's all connected. So we have to work with all these component parts, the physical, mm -hmm. the emotional, spiritual, uh, resistance, fixation. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So it's, it's an interesting um, thing for you to work with to, to take controlled substances again. Yeah. Yeah. And that hasn't right. turned into an addiction though. It hasn't gone down no. that. No, it hasn't. It has. It's been the opposite. So that's the really good news in terms of the recovery side. And because a lot of people, um, when they hear about the new model, they don't understand exactly what it is. The new model, as I said, is not about trying to force someone to stop doing something. Because when you try to force someone to stop doing something, they hear that often as I'm a bad person, I'm feeling judged, I'm feeling shame. And what's a great way to fix that? To go eat more cookies and do heroin. So it's almost like a, you think you're trying to help, but you're driving the person back to addiction. What I learned is, is that through this process is that pain is a driver, can be a driver for addiction. But if you've done a lot of work in a new model, your body actually starts to somatically say no to medication. Mm -hmm. So the idea will pop in my head that I could take low dose narcotic and it probably wouldn't impact my, I would take it as prescribed and it probably, I could probably function just while my mind's like, okay, that sounds good. That, that makes sense. But when I actually do it, my body, because of the work that I've done, says no and and that's almost like a downside to it because sometimes you need medication so i've actually had to do inquiry to force myself to take medication so that i can get to a place where right the pain level has come down a little bit yeah right. but then once it comes down i can i can then work with it mm -hmm. um, so i don't know what our original question was but i was getting to, to the answer of that so you know, there's such a crisis with all kinds of pain and certainly with physical pain as well. Now, you said a while ago you were working on an app. Yes. What's uh, the status with that? The app that I'm developing, which is called MPM, is an interface between physician and their chronic pain patients. It's an app that literally acts as an interface. And so what it does is it tracks everything that the person is using or doing in order to manage pain. And then it suggests, in the middle, it suggests harm reducing alternatives is what it does. Mm -hmm. So it'll, it'll suggest that um, today's not a good day for hydrocodone, which is in our, today because of where your pain level is, let's try something lower than that. Let's work with this mindfulness exercise. Let's work with CBD. Let's let's bring in an over-the-counter medication to see if we can manage it that way. Trying to give people guidance on how to not just take a painkiller every time you're in pain. Because that's how addiction starts. It's like if you wake up in the morning, you have any level of pain, you know you can take a painkiller and you know it's going to go be better within an hour. But is that necessary on every day that you have pain? And if you teach your brain that pain doesn't automatically mean painkiller, then your brain is not going to go to painkiller every time. But how do you treat your brain to understand that is that you have to provide alternatives and, you, and the brain has to understand that the alternative actually does work. And that if the pain level is not at a really high level, that it's more, actually more appropriate and healthier to go with a less harming, harmful uh, intervention. So it's trying to tell people that the wisdom behind it. It's like, we're trying to keep you, we're not only trying to treat your pain, we're trying to keep you from becoming addicted. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At the same time. So doctors and lawyers are very interested in this because it, it for the first time, it, it helps the liability on the doctor's side. Who Doctors have incredible difficulty managing what their clients are actually taking to medicate pain. They, they, they really don't have any clue. They prescribe something, but they don't know if some other doctors prescribe something or if somebody's getting something off the street. And so 
the more you can monitor what someone's taking and have them log that, the more legal protection from the doctors, because doctors are now being sued for um, unethical prescribing of opiates, which led mm -hmm. to heroin. So doctors are being, so heroin folk, folks who are using heroin 10 years later are going back and suing their doctor who started them on painkillers. So this is an important thing for doctors to understand. Your liability is going up with a drug epidemic. Mm -hmm. And so this app actually, it protects the safety of the patient first. That's its mm -hmm. first goal is to help the, the pain. It even has things built into it to help when people are getting surgical surgical procedures so that they can calm down during the procedure so they're listening to my voice mm -hmm. while it's going on and i'm saying just breathe and watch mm -hmm. any thoughts that come up but but the big thing that it does is it guides people out of this habit of taking a controlled substance every day regardless of the level of pain and, and right. paying more attention to what is that what do i actually need today not what have I been doing every day, but what is actually needed to function today? And reducing the harm of, 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 you know, not just sticking a heroin needle in your arm every time you have a slight disturbance, right. but really monitoring and understanding. And the app helps you monitor and understand that there are different ways to deal with different levels of pain. Wow, is that available now? No, we're in the development stage of it. Um, and so we hope to get it out soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll send out an email about it when it is to people that are signed up for the Radical Recovery Summit. So if uh, anyone signed up, they'll find out first. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, one thing, I know we, we've, we've, had, we've talked about, I think there's one thing we need to talk about is, is just the propensity towards becoming re-addicted in recovery when you have to take controlled substances for things like pain or cancer or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a real topic that people are interested in because it poses a real dilemma for their recovery. If their recovery has been abstinence-based and then a doctor says, well, you're not gonna be able to get through this surgery without taking painkillers. Um, we have to square that with our, with our mind. And here's the thing, I, I still go back to, my same answer is inquiry because the more you do the work around all the various motivations to use, like the trauma, the shame, the physical pain, the more you do that, the less you want to reach out to those substances for relief, just naturally. Um, and it's a process, it doesn't happen overnight, right? It's just over time, we, ch we start to change our relationship over time to these things. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanna tell people is that you know, when you're moving into this new model, it looks different than the old way, which is often just like, let's pick a date, and then after that date, you're not gonna drink. And, and that's gonna be our answer, right? I mean, we're gonna do some other work, but mainly, February 1st is your clean date, and, we're, and we, wanna, we wanna build up as much clean time. My, the reason I reject that is because it doesn't matter how much clean time I have if I have traumas that are unresolved. I can have 30 years of clean time, but still not have resolved the fact that my father molested me at age five. And if I haven't resolved that, that remains a risk for relapse, that thing. And so we wanted to focus more on the things that are driving the relapse rather than have you drank today? <laughs> you know, or, or when's the last mm. time you drank? It's so, it felt so superficial to start focusing on behavior when the issue is that people are addicted because they're trying to cope with something. Most of them are not just out partying. Some are, are, they're in Vegas just partying. But a lot of people are actually covering up and numbing out emotional and physical pain. And we're just trying to help them understand that. Well, and understanding it that way also helps to reduce the shame. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. right. Right, especially if you're in recovery and you're having to take painkillers again and then you feel the shame of that, you can do inquiry to reduce the shame. But I think the great thing and the great message to take home from this is with this new model where we're inquiring into all these things, um, it's hard, if not impossible, to become re-addicted. And I have like, 
direct experience of this. I mean, it's a, it was a, it's a joke in my household because it's like after the surgery, you know, it's like I, my body was rejecting the painkillers after the surgery. It was like, I, I don't want these anymore. But my friends were saying, well, take them for a few more days because, you know, but, but you have to be careful that because the body may need a few more days, but because it's worked out a lot of the issues, it doesn't crave the drug. Right. So when you don't crave the drug, you're not trying to prolong the use of the drug, which is how, what leads to chronic using. So what happens with when, is that when your body starts to feel clear somatically, it starts to reject things that are interfering with that. Mm -hmm. And it, on some level, it's like, no, 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 no. What did you just do here? It's like, you just altered something and it, and it sends a signal to us that like, that's not what I want, you know? So we have to watch that as we're um, using Western medicine medications that, that, right. that our body might start rejecting. We have to use those. My answer is that I could only use them in short term. Right. I could only use it a week at a time or two weeks at a time. My body would start to reject it. I would get relief from, from it. And mm -hmm. then I would pull away and, with, and withdraw out of those and then manage pain in a less harmful way for a while until I needed to go back to the controlled substance for a week or two right. and then pull back. It's a constant movement or a dance of harm reduction. You know, I think that's new model is just reducing harm. And instead of saying, Lynn, you got to stop today, everything, right. regardless of whether you're healed on your trauma, doesn't matter. Stop right. drinking today. Today is your sobriety day. Right. Well, how am I going to accomplish that if I've got a bunch of unresolved drivers going on that are just begging to be medicated and covered up? I mean, how am I going to actually accomplish that? And that was a serious question that we contemplated when we did when we when we developed the new model. Like, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you're medicating the physical pain. You're not medicating emotional and psychological pain. Both, probably. Well, but but what you're talking about with this is that you know, as you're de deciding what to take for painkiller, yeah. for your physical, you're, you're taking it for your physical pain. You're, you're yeah. working with inquiry in other ways of handling your emotional pain. And, yes. Uh, and this, is, th this is why people, I think, do get addicted is because they don't, they don't, they can't discern between what is the physical, physical sensation, its impact, discerning between that and the emotional and psychological stuff. So with inquiry, right. you can deal with the emotion. A pill is not a great way to deal with the emotional and psychological aspects of pain or injury. It's better to go in inquiry or therapy to, to let go of those stories. And then you can go back to working with the, uh, with just the sensation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is there anything that you wanted to finish with? Anything that you feel would be helpful just as we're uh, getting ready to close up? Uh, yeah, to, to the entire recovery community, um, I'm asking for more compassion and a deeper, more ch mature understanding of, of um, the pure abstinence approach. During periods of time when people are suffering with real illness and injury, because even when we say there, there's a lot of subtle shaming and judging that goes on for people who are actually trying to legitimately treat their, they're not actually drug seeking in recovery. Yeah. Like what's happening is that they're having to deal with something that's real for them and they need support. If, if their head is on straight around it, if their head is not looking to do drug seeking, it's actually looking for relief so I can function just for today, then you don't have to worry about the addict seeking thing. You can simply help them get clearer and clearer around the stories so i would just say to you don't get discouraged if you're around people um where you know that you need legitimate medical help but people are discouraging you from that for any reason because that's what i did i just i got discouraged out of going twice i got discouraged out of going to western medicine and the first time i did i almost died because i had uh, testicular cancer and i was being discouraged um, to go in because I was able to just be with the sensations and, and my non-dual spiritual friends were saying, oh, you know, it's, it's just Western medicine. They can't fix this. This is, um, but, but Western medicine did fix that. 
right. <laughs> they fixed it. They took the cancer away. Right. So, yeah, getting down and discerning between what is physical, so to speak, and what is emotional and psychological. Because the emotional and psychological stuff can be dealt with very well through our work. The physical stuff, we're getting better at it. We're going to learn more about it. But sometimes you have to integrate Western medicine. Um, you can't just rely on like spiritual or, or therapeutic techniques to deal with what is a physical injury or physical mm -hmm. pain the other day. Mm -hmm. That's just my perspective. Always subject to change, but that's where I'm at with all, mm -hmm. with all this. Get rid of the shame. Let's have a mature conversation about recovery. You know, stop shaming people who have to. I've seen this before. It's like people get diagnosed with cancer in recovery. And there's even been shaming around the fact that at the later uh, points in their life, they were given morphine. Right, right. And we don't need to do that. We don't, no. I don't and whether it's so. emotional pain that we're medicating or physical pain, we need to work with the pain. And, and then the other thing will drop away. Yeah. yeah. It's quite a journey you've been on. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And just insight after insight about addiction, recovery, pain, um, all those things that go with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So today, so where I'm at today is like what I call super sobriety. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I've, I've toyed with through the last year and a half. One of the first things I did is I tried THC because it became legal here. And oh. I found and I found that that wasn't the answer because it activated the, um, it would actually activate the spine and make it more. Oh. So THC, I did that for a while, but it, it, it stopped being um, a real viable way to help me reduce pain. At one point, you know, I had to take painkillers after surgery. At one point I had to take benzos because what benzos would do for me is they would calm the central nervous system down which was really agitated around this live wire feeling in my, um, imagine like a live wire going off in your, in your spine. And then your nervous system is, is nervous about that. So yeah. the benzos would come down and just help relax that. And just like the inquiry, I would also do the inquiry on yep. fixating so that it would come down. That's something that people can do. Um, mm -hmm. And lots of breathing and relaxation practices, things that help the nervous system. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. There have been times during this where I did the, the, the nostril breathing. Mm -hmm. that, and, and where that helped me a lot is when I was feeling at night, I was having breathing problems because this, whatever this is, obstructs breathing too. Right. Right. Yeah. They're seeing a connection between, um, between well, first of all, they're seeing a connection between depression and chronic pain, which we can get to, yeah. and there's a connection between um, what was the first thing that I said? The breathing and the pain in your spine. Breathing and the pain in your spine. Yes. So they're finding in Australia. I think it's Australia and England. There's some some studies that are being done where it's like um, they're finding that chronic spinal pain patients have a higher degree of respiratory issues than the normal control mm -hmm. and so there's some correlation between that so breathing which you're really good at your breathing techniques obviously are going to help reverse some of that or, or clear some of that um, i would think that it would be helpful to do some of that too and i have been mm -hmm. doing throughout my you know not every day but often yeah. often yeah yeah, plugging a nostril. And right. That's a powerful practice, and it's so simple. Yeah. 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 Well, and if we look at the impact on, on the nervous system of the threat of having something serious wrong with our body, and then it really helps to, to calm the nervous system. We do that because, you know, we work with thoughts, and then, and then we're not agitating our nervous system because of the thoughts. Yeah. And then working directly with relaxing and breathing and natural rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's kind of like a process of elimination because if you like your, if this question about whether this is um, just trauma or if this is physical can be answered through the process of elimination. So I start off with, okay, let me look at the stories that are surrounding the pain. Let me have those relaxed. So I can take that part of the thing out of it. 
and then comes down to okay there's the physical sensation and then how am i relating to the physical sensation if, is the, if there's a lot of resistance to that that could be making the physical sensation worse so i've got to then deal with that but then you might so you've eliminated so if you work this then you eliminate a lot of the stories mm -hmm. and you eliminate a lot of the no, maybe not all but a lot of the internal resistance that goes on with the pain mm -hmm. by eliminating all those things if you're still in a really bad place you might have to integrate with western medicine there could be a surgery that has to happen this is where it has to, these mm -hmm. things have to bridge together and work yeah. together it could be something physical that has to be dealt with mm -hmm. and kind of peeling back those layers at some point it's like uh it shows you where to go it's like it's like okay I've worked on the trauma of that. That feels clear, but I still have this. So maybe maybe it's resistance to this. So let me work with this tool Scott gave me. Then let's say you do that, and there's some relief, but it still feels like something is going on there. That's when you, if at the maybe even sooner than that, when you should be going to the doctor, getting X-rays, and finding out is there structurally something wrong that that only surgery can fix. I mean. We don't have any, as far as I know, we have no evidence that anyone through meditation or inquiry has actually changed the structure of a bone right, or, right. or, or stopped the bleeding arm cut off. Right, so right. limitations to what we think this stuff. And I think we need to understand where the limitations are. If we can do that by doing this process of elimination and getting rid of magical thinking which is the idea, which are unproven stuff gets disseminated as if I just think or change my thinking for sure something um, is going to happen a certain way. Well, we, there's lots of other magical thinking around healing that's around there. Anything to me that doesn't have some real solid backup in either anecdotal evidence or statistical evidence I have to know more about it before I can jump on board with it. Right. I, mean, I had to see that my inquiries were actually helping people before I could even jump on board with the fact that this is the approach that I want. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to see the changes. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what we're looking for now is just, can we see the changes in our chronic pain mm -hmm. patients? We, we've just started taking chronic pain patients here at uh. the Kildes. So if someone has chronic pain and they'd like to work with you, how, what's the best way to do that? Um, they don't have to come to the center. The, the thing that's good about the center is that for a fairly low cost, you can say for two to three days and get the entire training and get the entire thing in there. Um, when you do sessions online, you can do it, but you have to do it in a piecemeal fashion. So you're, you're going to get an hour this week and then maybe an hour next week. And so it's not such an intensive course on really working with the pain. Whereas if you come to the Killaby Center, it's a three day thing. You're assessed in the beginning medically. Um, and then we get down to um, working with just um, using the picture of that area to reduce or teach you how to reduce or eliminate the fixation with the pain. Mm -hmm. And then we teach you to come down into the somatic experience and enjoy the dance. So, mm -hmm. so you're hitting every element and when you're in the body enjoying the dance, you're letting that pain, you know, writhe and choke and contract or constrict or do whatever, but you're, but the attention inside of it is not trying to interfere with any of those movements. It's right. literally, it's almost supporting every movement that happens. And so when you're, when your attention is supporting every movement that's happening, there's zero resistance or something close to zero resistance because it's like your intention, if there is one, is to support the movement of this mm -hmm. rather than to try to get rid of it, to change it, or even to neutrally rest with it. It's not a neutral stance. It's almost going, no, go beyond neutrality. Instead, support and move with it. That dance, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can do that with anything, in everyday emotions or... Mm -hmm not just ongoing chronic pain is the dance is a good somatic exercise right yeah yeah well thank you and thank you
Yeah, thank you so much. This has been really illuminating and will give people some new ideas about how to work with this. And you're doing private sessions online again, so people could sign up for that. Yeah, and so just let me give them, if they, if they want to talk to me about private sessions, just email me at killabycenter at gmail.com, K-I-L-O-B-Y center at gmail.com. We have a few other facilitators who been working with chronic pain with me that if I can't work with you, I can refer them mm -hmm. to you. And I know then you have a lot of experience yourself working mm -hmm. with this. I mean, you, anybody would be in good hands with you. So that's another resource right there. They can email. Mm -hmm. You want to give your email again to reach out for that? Yes, it's Lynn Fraser still point at gmail.com. And anybody who'd like to come to the daily practice, it's been going on almost four years now. So it's every morning at 8 a.m. Eastern. And we do nervous system practices, relaxation, breathing, resting. Yeah. That's awesome. So where's that listed so people can find out more about it? Right. It's on my website. So it's lynnfraserstillpoint.com. Lynnfraserstillpoint.com, all one word. All one word, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I think that your, your meditations are also listed on my naturalrestforaddiction.com yeah. site. Where That's you can right. Mm -hmm. And on the Facebook pages, people can find us there as well. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing I would just say before we go, Lynn, I think what we're learning with this work is that the more we empower people to be able to do the work on their own, the better. And it's challenging to do that, but, but the better off they are in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, I'm as much a coach now as I am a facilitator or a teacher in the sense that I'm trying to encourage people to bring inquiry and awareness into their daily life. It's a coaching thing, mm -hmm. um, like how to do it and why to do it. And so one of the things is just the way that this work is changing is that I think the, the transformations are accelerating because people are not waiting for just a session. They're not waiting for each week's session to try to deal with their issues. They're right. learning ways to process those issues every day so that the transformation is moving along at a better rate. And that's a really good thing that we're developing, I right. think. That's really the key. If these, these tools are not complicated. They're no. quite simple if you can learn them. Yeah, yeah. They're, not, they're not complicated. I think the only thing is, is it's just a barrier of language. Because it's like, if you say to someone in a session, which we, as facilitators, we often say, if someone's feeling something, we'll say, can you remain, can you feel into it and just allow it to be, just let mm -hmm. it be? That's a good pointer, but sometimes the pointer just doesn't work because they don't know constitutionally how to allow something because they haven't accessed that awareness that naturally allows something. So they're almost coming from right. an ego state that's trying mm -hmm. to allow something and it's not working. And that's where I started talking about the dance because it's like, okay, I'm supposed to allow, but I don't know how to allow. So I say envision the dance. How does the dance work? Someone has to lead the dance. If both people try to lead the dance, there's resistance to each other and it doesn't work. Let someone lead the dance. And the thing that leads the dance is the sensation or the feeling itself. You as the attention that comes into it are merely tracking and following them. You're dancing with it rather than trying to control the movement of it. Right. That's yeah. And that's, that's been so helpful for so many people. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot like the tools that you and I already use because we use a lot of mm -hmm. tools that are about reducing resistance. This is just another mm -hmm. good, um, to help reduce that resistance. Well, and I'd also, you know, it's also important to acknowledge that when there's trauma that we need help sometimes just to stay present and a, facilitate, a facilitator can be really helpful with that for a while. And so not to discourage people from getting the help so that they can feel safe enough to stay. Yeah. And, so, and then also to work with it on our own is, yeah. um, there's a lot of ways to heal. There is, and a lot of it comes down to finances. Like if people don't have the money to afford a bunch of sessions, then what we're trying to do, I think, is trying to educate and give them different ways that are less costly so that they can continue doing the work. And I think over time, we're gonna learn how to have more access to this work. Mm -hmm. Like sort of people who, I mean, we're, we're working out those details now, 
because each of you as facilitators have to pay your own bills. Like you have to charge mm -hmm. in order to function to have a house to do more sessions mm -hmm. to help people. Um, and, so, yeah. but, but some people are not getting access to this work because they can't afford it. So one right. thing we're, we're trying to figure out how to fix that. Like, how can we, you know, how can we make it more accessible to people so right. that they don't have to pay a treatment center price to come get it or if they don't have to pay for a year of session with Lynn, even though that helps you financially, is that, is that really what's mm -hmm. good for, for the client, you know? Right. And for some people it is and for others it's not necessary. So there's a lot of different options there. And I like to have quite a few free things too so that people can, you know, go through an online course or something like that and learn the basics. And then, you know, through classes and things as well. So people have lots of different options. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah, exactly. That's good to give them options. I think the big thing is that people have to really feel it. People have to feel it that it's possible to heal and to have some optimism and, and hope around that. And once we do that, then I think the tools are, those can fall into place quite easily. I do. I really do. And I would only, I would only, um, footnote that by saying I, I do totally agree with you because if, if people lose the desire to heal what can happen is that they'll lose the desire even to rest with sensation or do anything and it becomes a complete bypass away from the whole thing and they're not off any better at all mm -hmm. from it, you know so mm -hmm. you want to kind of try to avoid any of the bypassing that can come out of that but yeah, yeah. Well, fascinating as always to talk with you, Scott. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. One of my favorite topics right now. So if any of you reach, are you dealing with uh, physical pain and recovery, reach out to me. Would love to try to help you. It's the most, again, the most relevant topic in my life right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Hello, this is Lynn Fraser with the Killaby Center Radical Recovery Summit. We are so excited to bring you the lineup for January 10th to 19th, 2020. Go to RadicalRecoverySummit.com to see the new headliners for 2020 and to sign up. You can watch free January 10th to 19th or buy an all-access pass.